I think it's really important for us who are fans of the open internet to think about what language, uh, what structures, what ways of, of talking about why we care about the internet we need to use so that we're not just talking to one another and holding hands and singing Kumbaya, right? Um, um, I, I think it was almost uh, 20 years ago, 1997, that a bunch of nerds got into a room and, and created this crazy thing, this open source browser called Firefox, which is, was a signal event, I think, in the, in the history of the web. As more and more people come online, that event in 1997 means less and less to the 15-year-old kid in Vigneal del Mar or the 42-year-old the farmer coming on, uh, come, going on the internet for the first time in Mozambique. And, and the challenge we've put forth for the, pan, for the next group that's going to be talking is, is how do we do that? How do we take these values and approaches and frame of the open web that we all care and value so much, how do we transfer that to, to the three billion people on the planet who will be coming on the web over the next couple of years? Um, so I am going to hand it off to this, three, this esteemed group of, of uh, uh, folks who have all actually, as I think about it, they've all been, well, I'm of sort of Knight, News, Knight Foundation family members in different ways. Uh, Seamus Kraft, the executive, founding executive director of the Open Gov Foundation. Mark Sermon, the executive director of Mozilla Foundation. Elise Hu, uh, technology and culture reporter for NPR. All have uh, been great partners and, and advisors to us at Knight Foundation. So I'm excited to hear what they come up with. Elise, I'll hand it over to you, because you're in charge. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us post-lunch. Um, we want to make this a conversation and not a panel so that all of you all can get involved. And um, to sort of frame the conversation, and as John set this up really well, this is kind of the heart of the economy going forward. This issue is also um, newsy this summer, and, uh, and it's the theme of this conference. It's why we're meeting. So it's really exciting that we get to talk about this and to sort of frame um, his thoughts on this going forward. Mark has prepared a few short slides to get us in the right mindset and so that we can watch parts of a movie. So <laughs> we're going to start with Mark and then um, post Mark, we'll uh, talk a little bit about Seamus's background and how we got here. So Mark, over okay. to you. Okay. Hi, guys. Hello! Hey. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the internet server is so quiet. Um, so do we have my slides up? Awesome. So um, I'm going to talk about the open internet a little bit, but first uh, I need to air a little bit of dirty laundry. Uh, this is the banned Mark Sermon grade 11 yearbook picture. And, you know, I put this up there. I live in a very small town in northern Ontario, about 10,000 people, Milltown. And I, I put this up not because I want sympathy for having been the one punk rock kid in Kenora, Ontario, but because as I think about the internet every day in my work, a lot comes from that moment in, in my life. That it was so exciting, I was so drawn in by the idea that anybody, anybody could pick up a guitar, write a song. Anybody could get a Tascam four-track cassette recorder and record an album. Anybody, like me, could get a pair of scissors, some glue, and a photocopier and make a magazine. And while today that just seems absolutely trivial, at the time, that was just revolutionary. Punk was a revolutionary movement, a movement of resistance against a monoculture of, a monoculture of culture. And the, the thing that really has stayed with me from that time, although I'm still as bald, <laughs> um, the other thing that has stayed with me other than the haircut uh, is this DIY ethos that was absolutely central to what punk rock was and I think came into the hearts and minds of tens of millions of people around the world. And that ethos still guides me every day in, in leadership, in parenting, in whatever I do. And I think that ethos really has infused itself in ways that now are the maker movement or really a lot about what the web is. And 
that's actually the kind of thing, to John's point, we need to think about with the web and the open web. And I think that we haven't quite done, and in fact, are in danger of losing, which is how do we build an ethos of the open web, of the things we believe, that really is in the hearts of you know, most or all of the people that it touches, so that it shapes who they are, who their children are, what we build into the future, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. So that's the, the theme I want to talk about, is the ethos of the open web, where there have been some victories that Mozilla has been involved in, where we are now, which is I think we're losing, uh, and you know, how do we turn that around? Um, but I want to start a little bit with two sub-themes that are really important to me. One is heroes, and who are the heroes that we look to? And certainly in, in punk rock, it was people like The Clash and The Sex Pistols and The Dead Kennedy. You always need or benefit from heroes who kind of draw you and embody that ethos. So I want to talk a little bit about heroes in the open web, but I also want to talk about Lego, which to me, you know, the internet at its best is just a big kit of Lego. So it's, a, for me, a good way to think about what the open web is. So we'll start with a little bit of a movie uh, teaser on the theory, the, the theme of heroes and Lego. And if you haven't seen the Lego movie uh, and you don't want a spoiler, leave now. <laughs> Woo! Nothing's gonna stop me now. Wait. This is the evil guy, oh, Mr. Business. Now there's a prophecy about the piece of resistance. Oh yes, a supposed missing piece of resistance that can somehow magically disarm the craggle. Give me a break. The craggle is the super weapon <gasps> being carried away. One day, a talented lasso fellow, a special one with face of yellow, will make the piece of resistance found from its hiding refuge underground. And with a noble army at the helm, this master builder will thwart the craggle and save the realm and be the greatest, most interesting, most important person of all times. So, so what's <laughs> happened here? is Mr. Business, uh, you know, who uh, has taken the craggle, the evil weapon, uh, that he is going to use to take control over the whole world of Lego. And, you know, we've heard that there is a hero coming. If we can just wait, the hero will lead the resistance. And, you know, for me, I, I had the opportunity about five years ago to go and um, become executive director of Mozilla Foundation, really help reboot what we were doing. And it went because those were my heroes. The people who had founded Mozilla well before me and it started, as John said, in the late 90s, became a foundation in, in 2003. And they had an ethos that drew me. Although I think it's an ethos that we have done a very poor job, all of us, but Mozilla included, of explaining to the world. The two billion people on the web don't know what the open internet is. Now, the closest I have gotten before uh, is you know, th there's two things. We, we often talk about op openness in terms of interoperability and end-to-end -end principles and all of this stuff that, that we, you know, the kind of language we use here. But to me, the test of whether we're getting where we're going, the ethos I believe in, is in an internet where anyone can make anything and where anyone can share with anyone. And so make anything is that Lego piece of it, the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, without asking anybody's permission, you can make what you want, and it's very open-ended. The share with anyone is an open network that anyone can get anything across. And when Mozilla started as a foundation in 2003, that was not the internet we were trending towards. Microsoft had a monopoly on how people saw the internet. It was 99% of the browser market. They were taking that Lego set and moving it towards ActiveX, moving it away from a standard implementation of HTML. The open internet, the Lego set, was under threat. And this group of people, who I actually still, in many ways, consider my heroes, even though I get to work with them every day, the founders, really, of the Firefox era of the Mozilla project, said, we're only 10 people. We've got thousands of volunteers. Sure, let's take on the biggest company in the world, because we actually see the web as being under threat. And they did an amazing thing. They did you know, something nobody thought was possible a nonprofit that took on the most dominant software company in the world at its own game and built a set of values into a product that then went on to take 25% of market share. And that vision of Firefox is very particular to, I think, 
something we can be proud of as Mozilla, can be grateful for as, as people who care about the open web, but should understand and see how we can seize again in the future, which is they didn't just go and say, you know, Microsoft is bad or try to change policy, although I do think the antitrust case against Microsoft was important in this story. They said, let's build our values into the way people use the internet every day, and let's do that with a piece of software people want that has you know, trivial things, but things that people desire, like pop-up blocking and better security, and then let's get that in the hands of hundreds of millions of people. And that's what they were able to do, uh, and not only do for Firefox, but they brought web standards across from Firefox into Chrome, into Safari, into IE even, where now, it seems trivial, but you can basically run advanced software across any platform and not worry what kind of computer you're on. And that's because the open internet won. And it's because uh, you know, the, the folks who made Firefox did play an important role, I think, as heroes in that way. Um, and the, you know, the result is the internet we all know and love today, YouTube, Gmail, all of those things were not possible until the web standards that underlie things like Ajax uh, you know, became commonplace on our computers. But the thing is, with that victory behind us, um, it's not actually necessarily the case that, that things are going well. The companies that now own large percentage, the, most of the internet traffic that benefited from that, themselves for business reasons, start to wonder whether that open ethos, the make anything, share anywhere, uh, you know, actually works for them or not. And so we're actually at a different moment in the Lego movie right now. So let's pause and look at that. <laughs> and it's not just you, bad cop, that keeps messing up my plans. People everywhere are always messing with my stuff. But I have a way to fix that. A way to keep things exactly the, the way comes they are back supposed out. to be. Permanently. Behold, the most powerful weapon of all the relics. The Fraggles! <laughs> oh, I love that moment. <laughs> it's such a good movie. If you haven't seen it, go see it. So, <laughs> you know, the, I got kids who are 12 and 14 who I saw that movie with and loved it. Uh, and they love the web as it is today. Uh, and you know, they're YouTubers, they both publish YouTube videos, they love things like Zoella and Tyler Oakley who are two famous vloggers. Um, for them, the internet is awesome. Uh, and you know, it, it is a creative outlet that is unlike anything I grew up with in the television era. Um, and in many ways there's so much still to celebrate from the victories that have come and the things that the web ha has unfolded. But, you know, at the same time, if you think about the big tension, like pre-crazy glue in the Lego movie, it is between the construction set mentality and the open-ended box of Lego. And we really have, in many ways, moved into the construction set era. Yes, you can put things on Facebook. Yes, you can put things on Instagram, but in a very prescribed way. And that may be good or may be bad, and there's a lot of freedom and wonder in that, uh, but also a lot of constraint, and constraint that you know, as Rebecca talked about uh, this morning, is a set of, a small set of sovereigns of the internet who decide how that's gonna work. Maybe you care, maybe you don't. But it is very different than the open internet where anyone can make anything and share with anyone. The things you can make are prescribed and how they move around is increasingly limited and siloed and also prescribed. But at the same time, if we kind of take the health of our ethos, ethos do a health check on it, Governments are also screwing with that ethos, uh, whether that is China or other places that are trying to block, or America or other places that are trying to surveil. Governments are screwing the internet in ways that are palpable and widely understood, that we all feel. And certainly as people who stand for that ethos, that open ethos, uh, you know, feel under threat. Companies are doing the same thing, and we are in what I think is actually an exciting th fight around net neutrality in the US this summer. And I think more and more important, the way that mobile phones define how we see the internet is really undermining, virtually erasing that ethos. And just you know, one thought on that, that that often we don't consider, for the next three billion people who come online, we're gonna be about five billion people online within the next 10 years, this will be their only computer. 
And this is primarily a content consumption device or a one-to-one -one communications device. So imagine if that was your only computer. And then imagine if that was the only computer of most people on the internet. And imagine if that set their expectations of what was possible. That is very much the Lego construction set reality, not the open ethos of the internet. And the, you know, just to underline that, the thing that we really haven't paid attention to is we've gone from the most democratic distribution system for information ever, the URL, where anyone can make anything, anyone can distribute to anyone, to now some, a situation where two companies control all the software distribution that will go to the next three billion people who get on the internet and increasingly control the media distribution. So we've gone from the most open distribution system in the history of humanity to the most locked down, and we've loved it. And that's where we are. So that plus China plus you know the, the black and white YouTube, I don't feel awesome about the ethos of the open internet surviving. Not because there's not a lot of good stuff we're doing, but because the people who come online in the next 10 years just won't know what it is. It'll just fade off into history. Uh, and I don't want that to happen. And so the question is, where are the heroes and how do we find them? Which I think will be the subject of our talk. But to get us there, one last clip, ruining the end of the Lego movie for you. Aww. I know things seem kind of bad right now, but there is a way out of this. This is Emmett. And he was just like all of you. A face in the crowd, following the same instructions as you. He was so good at fitting in, no one ever saw him. And I owe you an apology, because I used to look down on people like that. I used to think they were followers with no ideas or vision. Because it turns out Emmett had great ideas. And even though they seemed weird and kind of pointless, they actually came closer than anyone else to saving the universe. And now we have to finish what he started by making whatever weird thing pops into our heads. All of you have the ability inside of you to be a groundbreaker. And I mean literally. Break the ground. Peel up the pieces. Tear apart your walls. Build things only you could build. Defend yourselves. We need to fight back against President Business's plans to freeze us. Yeah. Round of applause for the Lego movie and fighting back. And so the, the message may seem trite and obvious that in all of us and everyone around us are the heroes. And that's the, the theme of this movie, that we do need to pick up the pieces of the Lego and build the reality we want. And in doing that, they chase away the evil bad uh, crazy glue machines with cool, weird spaceships that they build, which all of us can clearly do with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, but the, you know, the, the message is important in that the, the solution or the, the way to take the ethos that I believe in and I, I believe many of you believe in and make it pervasive, make it something that lasts for decades or centuries inside of our hearts and in the way we shape what our society becomes, comes from people picking up and building. And this is a group of people who are doing that, whether we're working on net neutrality policy, trying to build an, an open phone operating system as Mozilla is, trying to teach people to code. All those things matter and that's what that scene is about. And we're all doing those things and we're all failing still. And that's the question that I want to engage with here, is it actually isn't in this room, certainly that we're going to get to enough weight to protect and grow and deepen the ethos of the open internet. Uh, and it's certainly not in that next three billion people that we'll be able to have an impact. We have to look at how do we actually encourage a next generation of leaders, of people who are going to be able to carry that ethos forward. And that's the thing I don't know how to do. Because my kids, they love just being YouTubers. And so I guess my question is, for my kids, the YouTubers, or for the farmer John mentioned, like, how do we build the next, I would say, two, three, five, ten million 10 million people who carry forth the ethos of the open internet? And that's, 
our question for today. Right, and, I'm, and Mark, I'm glad that you brought up the next generation because I know you're talking about your kids and, and toddlers and babies that aren't even born yet. Um, I don't like toddlers and babies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but my kids are on. The truth is out. Um, but Seamus is actually a poster child for somebody who went from passive consumer um, mm -hmm. in your high school days, probably, to now a fighter for the open internet. Uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing now, but more importantly, I'm interested in how you got from high school guy chasing girls to um, he, his words, not mine, to, to <laughs> I was there. <laughs> to the co-founder of Open Gov Foundation. Uh, well, like any red-blooded American man, I, uh, I got into this for girls and rock music. Um, and I'm not joking. Uh, I used the internet a lot in high school. Uh, Instant Messenger, that was how I picked up my ladies. Um, <laughs> And jam bands. So Mark, Mark talked about uh, punk rock. I got into this through my heroes, Jerry Garcia and Trey Anastasio, Grateful Dead and Fish. Uh, we started off trading music, right? Actual male trading. So I would burn CDs of shows that I had. I would send them off in the mail to some guy. He would send some new shows back to me, and we would form that relationship. Uh, and then dial up, turn to DSL. And we didn't have to do that anymore. Uh, we could just send those shows or didn't even need to engage. We could download them right online. And I found this community. And this community came together on the internet. I didn't care about how it happened, just that it did, just that I could get my shows and add to my growing collection. And then as I got older, I would go to concerts and I would meet friends who I only knew via the internet uh, or through mail order trading. Uh, they were making lot art and fan shirts and expressing themselves however they wanted and then turning around and selling that stuff online, direct one-to-one -one relationships. Uh, that freedom, that sense of it's better together uh, was how I got into all of this. And uh, that grew up until I was working in Congress, still a huge deadhead, still a huge fish fan, and then this whole Sopa and Pippa thing happened. And when that popped up, that was when I became a real fighter. I was a passive consumer until that moment because at that point I said, what I enjoyed as a young man, instant messaging late at night with girls or trading or downloading shows that I wanted from the Grateful Dead or Fish, that's not gonna be around anymore if, if we let Congress muck it up. Um, so I embraced those open web principles, but I came at it from a non-technical background, and I didn't really even care about the open web principles. I cared about getting the music or getting the girl, uh, and that's how the Open Gov Foundation really started. So Mark Sherman, what are you hearing there in what Seamus describes as a pretty organic story in coming to this ethos that you're talking about um, that could actually be practically applied to, to a bigger population of other passive consumers out there? Well, I, you know, first of all, I don't think you were quite a passive consumer. You know, you were sharing shows, and, and I think that's a, a key piece of it is really how do we feel the Internet and what do we expect from it, right? You expected to be able to trade music. Whether it was legal or, or not, you expected the system to do that. And so if it was something that was actually going to change that set of expectations, like break the, the system. So I think one of the things is how do we design and, and build products on the Internet where the things people want build that set of expectations. And I think that's really one of the reasons I'm so focused or we're so focused on phones right now is we aren't building those expectations, right? That, you know, you don't have the expectation necessarily that you can share music in the same way on, on a mobile device. So, you know, one thing is you probably cared about it more than, more than you say and was easily activated because it was going to be taken away. Yeah. And we're obviously talking to a room, a, a room of friends, right? You're essentially preaching to the choir. All of us tend to care about these issues and seem fairly knowledgeable about them. But uh, just a few weeks ago, since we're in the middle of a net neutrality debate right now, just a few weeks ago, uh, my friend and yours, John Oliver, made a really salient point, which um, we're going to put up on the screen for you, uh, that sort of speaks to uh, one of the big challenges of communicating this issue today. The only two words that promise more boredom in the English language are featuring Sting. And, <laughs> and hearing, hearing, hearing people talk about it is somehow even worse. As anticipated, the notice proposes to ground the net neutrality rules in Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Oh my God, that is the most boring thing I've ever seen. <laughs> that is even boring by C-SPAN standards. 
I would rather read a book by Thomas Friedman than sit through that hearing. <laughs> I would rather listen to a pair of dockers tell me about the weird dream it had. <laughs> So, for those of you who didn't get to see the full 13-minute rant, John Oliver made a, went on his show last week tonight and uh, talked about net neutrality for 13 minutes. He renamed it into something um, that was a little bit more palatable um, for consumers to kind of get. And uh, the next, I guess overnight and the next day, uh, users crashed the FCC's open commenting um, servers <laughs> to, to try and... Uh, preserve net neutrality regulations. And so um, what happened there was really fascinating in that it was really boring and yet somehow he was able to galvanize the public. So I guess my question is, do y'all have a branding problem? I mean, is this something that just the people in this room and the people on K Street and Sand Hill Road care about, as, as Michael Manis has said again and again? I think we do, absolutely. <laughs> um, and it's, it, it goes back to my getting the girl or getting the show. How I got that didn't matter. And we all in this room, because of who we are and where we are, I think we like to talk about that sort of how the information travels from point A to point B and focus less on what that information is, whereas most consumers of our products and most of our users only care about what's getting there from point A to point B. Um, and on top of that, even some of the language that we've heard over and over and over again today uh, puts off people and actually scares them. Um, open source, open source, open data, open networks. Um, we've done a lot of uh, focus groups, dial testing, large sample surveys with average everyday Americans. Those words actually uh, paradoxically make them less likely to trust our products and use our products because when they hear open, they hear hackable. They hear um, viruses can get in, uh, my data can get out, anybody can go in. Um, that's a real problem because if, if you're stuck at that level, uh, how do you get them to support the open internet principles that we all want to uh, if all you're talking about are those words that can be scary? So how do you solve for that? Well, I think, you know, it is a branding problem uh, and, you know, we need something like DIY that, you know, I see me in it and I want to be connected to that brand. But I think we also have, a, you know, a, a strategy or a game plan problem that we need to solve and is actually where we need to solve for it, which is we tend, as, as lots of progressive movements actually historically have, to play defense and not offense. And I think that the real lesson, what attracted me to Mozilla in the beginning was this offense play, which is let's give people something they want. And then in giving them something they want, build those values, build the opportunity, build the expectation into that. So I think you know, partly we need to solve it. I mean, maybe there's Peter's here and we can get some branding help. <laughs> but, you know, beyond the branding problem, I think we need to look at how do we play offense. One of the things I had heard kind of bandied around, uh, I guess, coming out of PDF is imagining, you know, the web is actually something people do love and do want. Cable companies are not the people that, that most folks love the most. So, you know, one interesting off offense play that ties to branding is Team Web versus Team Cable in you know, how we go after this, is there is a deep emotional positive association with our lives online. Let's play offense on that as opposed to you know, try and actually shut down and play defense against the bad guys. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Pew, Pew polls I think are perfect. If you look at how it tracks over time, the internet is the hardest thing for people to give up. Uh, when they were asked if you had to give up internet, telephone, TV, or car, internet was at the top. I mean, I think we, there is something there we can build off of, um, but I don't think we're building off of it yet. It's amazing. As a Torontonian, that was the one thing they let Rob Ford keep when he went into rehab. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't give it up. And his Crocs. I don't know if you saw that photo. But, um, <laughs> he was they were Wi-Fi Crocs. He was wearing Crocs in rehab. Um, so, but if I'm a consumer and I'm getting my Netflix and I'm able to binge watch my Orange is the New Black or whatever it is, then what difference does it make to me who owns the pipes? I mean, or if Netflix is paying a little extra to get that faster to me, so long as I'm getting it and I'm not having like long buffering times. I, I think that that's the, the problem is we're trying to like solve it on logic like that as opposed to be at a much more emotional level, which is to say, you know, the, the brands you love, the thing you love, which is Netflix, uh, which is Mozilla, which is whoever, like are under threat in some abstract, 
visceral way that you connect with emotionally, and the brands you hate uh, are you know, trying to use government graft and bad politics to get some advantage for themselves. I think that getting people to understand the pipes is actually not going to be the, wi the winning strategy. And I think that's what we've tried to do for too many years, at least in the short term. I think in the long term, there is a piece about treating, understanding the digital world as being as essential as learning to read, learning to write, learning math. That if you actually want in the long run to build out this ethos, people need to understand to some degree how this stuff works. Not so you can win net neutrality debates, but so they actually can have control of their lives. So on the digital literacy point, that's really interesting because we have policymakers that are making a lot of these decisions um, and setting um, a general sort of framework for our ethos in Congress and even at, when it comes to school boards, setting curriculum for what our kids are learning. And so, um, Seamus, as somebody who was working in Congress, co-founded your foundation with um, Congressman Issa, talk a little bit about sort of um, the digital literacy component when it comes to policymakers. What's sort of at risk here when our lawmakers don't understand the difference between a DM and a, and a tweet, as we famously saw with Anthony Weiner? Um, <laughs> if, I had a, if I had a desk, I would put my head down onto it right about <laughs> now. Um, we all know that government doesn't get a lot of what we're talking about. Elected officials, staff, well, the, the staff, the younger staff absolutely do. Um, and I think that Bill Hunt, one of my colleagues back here, uh, Bill, raise your hand. No, raise your hand, Bill. Um, he's great at when we, when we build our software and we talk to people is getting at those staffers who are younger. Um, it's all about making their lives more efficient, easier, more social, more collaborative, all of those values, those buzzwords that we love, um, but treating them like users. Uh, so often, uh, folks in the open internet world approach policymakers and approach staff in a default adversarial role with good reason, um, but don't treat them like you would treat other users elsewhere uh, with the support, with the patience, with the human-centered design. Uh, I want to help you get your job done and make your life a little bit easier. Uh, I think that's a huge, huge, huge missing component that does go a long way. And I know there's some folks in this, wor this room that were very successful lobbying against SOPA. Evan Greer, is he in here? Uh, there you are. Um, I watched your messaging change, you and Tiffany, over time from when SOPA landed to when my mom was able to say, I don't want SOPA. And it was when you seized on the Bieber stuff. Yeah. You take, you take away my ability to see Justin Bieber movies or videos or songs he's singing on the internet? What the hell? No way. Uh, once you got to that point, that was the, the tipping point. But it was when we stopped talking about the pipes. And it's the same thing with policymakers. When you talk about, do it this way, your bills will get passed, your constituents will be happier. Um, those are the outcomes that they want. And we can match those pretty easily. And I think we're pretty close. And I think that is the offense versus defense. And exactly. it's probably not offense versus, but offense and. You know, we need to build, we need to fight. And I think we often go at this just with fight. We promised um, that you all would be involved in a lot of this conversation. And so John Bracken is our mic runner today, our esteemed mic runner. Um, and then if I know a few of you um, kind of want to challenge the very notion of what we're talking about today. So why don't we start with Waldo um, and go from there. Actually, uh, security. Could you please? <laughs> <laughs> Tell uh, everyone who you are. Sure, my name is Walter Jake with. I'm the director of the US Open Data Institute, a knight backed organization for which I'm very grateful. Uh, so I would like to hear uh, the other side of the net neutrality argument. Uh, guys like Dave Harbor and uh, organizations like the CWA with the Communications Workers of America, the union, uh, they oppose uh, net neutrality. There are, I've heard some very good arguments on the other side, and it seems more like a difference of philosophy. I would like to hear either of y'all make a persuasive case against net neutrality, because there is one to be made, and I'd like to hear more of it. I wonder which one to make. Um, <laughs> so do you actually want us to, to do that, yeah. or do you want to get more questions first? Because I guess, you know, my... my <laughs> <laughs> Next question. I'm not, gonna, question. I'm not gonna let her answer. You know, my, my quick one, which would be different than the CWAs. I mean, I would actually argue that yes, the CWA has a, a different philosophy because they come from a different time when we had a very different, and I would argue worse, communication system, and they have a vested economic interest in it. But that aside, 
I, I think there are some good arguments, and I think we will actually see multiple internets emerge, and we have a question of how do we keep net neutrality for the, the purposes of free expression, for the um, having open markets, all of the things that a, an open network lets you do, and at the same time have the choice to opt out and have our own security and privacy. And so there was a, a project that was going on that Harlow was telling me about yesterday at the Open News Hack Weekend, which was about offline mesh-oriented networks where we really just want to be able to, to talk to each other because we don't want to be surveilled at all. We really want to be completely off the main network infrastructure. So I, you know, I, I, that's my one argument I would make in favor of having multiple internets, which does then break net neutrality. I think there's others um, you know, that, say, Facebook would make in zero rating data in Africa that says you're going to give people more access because we're giving preferential traffic to, to somebody like Facebook. Um, I think there's lots of arguments that, that can be made in favor of it. In the end, I do think that the democracy and the open markets that the, the internet can enable are so important that those, the open network argument is the one that has to win. I mean, I, would, I, I agree with that. And I would only add to that is the, the notion of competition is we're talking, we're talking here about um, really two pr providers. Um, if you go, uh, who, who had dial-up internet? Did everybody have dial-up internet at some point? Right, okay. Um, you remember how those prices went down? Uh, you started off, you got that AOL 600 minute CD. Uh, <laughs> that's all you, the internet that you got this month. Um, as internet service providers through dial-up expanded, then you got unlimited internet. Uh, and so you had competition where something like free markets would work. Right now we're talking about Comcast, Verizon mostly, so two big guys. Um, is that true competition? So even it, with net neutrality rules, do you really have the competition that we all think, and are you going to get the benefits of the competition with only two providers? I don't think so. All right, next question. Hi, David Ryan from Arizona State University. Um, so we've talked about the ambiguity of explaining the pipes, but another piece that I think is ambiguous for a lot of people is that companies that haven't been created yet could not exist because of net neutrality. But I think that's an easier one to explain. Um, so I was hoping you might touch on that and, and how we might go forward with that. So unborn companies um, that are under threat if net neutrality isn't maintained as, as it is. Well, it, maybe I'll, I'll take it for a second, which is, that, I mean, a key piece in my sort of open definition of make anything be able to share with anyone is inherently about not needing to ask permission. And so, you know, there being a level playing field in terms of who can do what and not having to ask whether or not I can do it. And certainly, you know, the, the, whether you like Facebook or not, we wouldn't have had Facebook if Zuckerberg had to, had to ask Harvard that he wanted to set it up. Or we wouldn't have Mozilla if we'd had to ask Microsoft whether people could install Firefox on Windows. And, you know, the permissionless innovation environment, a level playing field for that is absolutely key to most of the things that we actually do love about the Internet. I, I guess, and maybe this is another argument against net neutrality, I think there are bigger threats to the unborn companies. And so I do think we want innovations, whether they're companies or activists or whoever, to be able to get out there to the world without asking permission. But frankly, the smartphone operating systems are a far, far bigger friction and barrier, especially when we're talking about the next 3 billion internet users for those unborn companies than net neutrality is likely to be. And this kind of gets back at my earlier question, though. So if my reality is shaped by the parameters set by Google or Apple, um, and that's just the way I understand my interaction with the web, just as you know, my, uh, my, we have a Chinese national who takes care of my daughter. She didn't realize that she was center, censored when we kind of had these conversations. Her reality was what it was. And so if, if my sort of understanding of where I can build and how I can build is shaped by whatever parameters were already set for me, what difference would it make to me when I'm not even sort of aware of it? I, I mean, I think ultimately that Tricky question. Um, <laughs> but I think that is where the role of, of 
getting out there and actually building services that have that open internet ethos in them that that person may get in their hands. I mean, it's why we're trying to, despite all likelihood of failure, build Firefox OS and get it out into emerging markets where people are getting their first smartphone is so that they have, uh, you know, they have a, a computer in their hand that works like a computer, that if I write an app that's just for the three of us, because it's easy to make an app on the device, I can text it to you, I don't have to send it through Mozilla, I don't have to send it through Google. Right. So if we start to build products that build in those expectations, that's, you know, that's how we win with that person. So there has to be kind of a compare contrast. Well, we have, well, and we have to compete with a different set of value propositions that build in the values we care about. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. I think what we're, what we're all seeking here is almost a, a new renaissance. We, we had it started in 1997 with the, the heroes of which you are one. I'm not. I just work for them. Oh, I just, <laughs> well, don't sell yourself short. Um, but a new renaissance. Well, how did the, the last renaissance start? Uh, it was the rediscovery and the redistribution of a, a poem, a beautiful poem by Lucretius called De Rerum Natura, or On the Nature of Things. And is the, this how you pick up girls? This, uh, no, I, do you think it's going to work? Hey, baby, <laughs> are you into the open internet? No, that's, that's how I do it. Um, but what, what sparked the renaissance there was a complete mind blown. The entire Western Hemisphere's mind collectively was blown because this poem, beautiful, beautiful Latin, that's what attracted people. But it showed an entire new universe uh, to folks who had been inside of a box for the whole Middle Ages. And it was a simple poem that everybody copied, reread, read to one another, uh, that even, even if they didn't like it, it still showed a completely different worldview from what was accepted. And what we're talking about here is a completely different worldview than the one that is accepted. I don't know how we get there, and I don't know what our on the nature of things will be. Um, but I think that there are some folks in this room who are actually starting to write that, share it, and spread it online. But I think that the, the worry is we actually have felt that in the tens or hundreds of millions of people, that new world. But as the number of people who come online and experience different kinds of vi different visions of the internet don't experience that, that poem may just you know fall away into the sands of history. Yeah. We got a All right, we got a question from the back. All right, hello. Um, my name is Latoya Peterson. And I had a question for the panel, but first I kind of want to direct people, if you're not following the back channel, there's a very interesting conversation going on about sex and gender and kind of a second conversation that's happening outside of the panel that's really intriguing. Um. <laughs> yeah, I noticed, I was going to say, I noticed that photo in your, sli your, your slide presentation that there was one female in the group of these original punk rockers at, at Mozilla. And so I wanted to ask you about how you thought about inclusiveness. But Latoya, you go first. Oh, thank you. So. <laughs> Speaking of punk, so I'm from DC, and we have two very, thank you, and we have two different scenes, right? You have the punk rock scene, but we also have the go-go scene, Yeah. right? I'm representing Cool Disco Dan today, but, you know, there are many other reasons with this, and I think that the overall conversation we're having about cultural context and getting people to understand really requires us to figure out how to open up, right? And so in DC, there's definitely, there were punk kids and there were go-go kids, but there was also a lot of respect. There were a lot of things in common. So just because we didn't necessarily rock to the same music, and sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't, it didn't mean that we couldn't have like, similar values in common. There's something out of nothing, DIY, resisting gentrification. A lot of the things that are in both movements are very similar uh, about caring about people, about caring about spaces beyond commercialism, right? But I think sometimes, particularly with open web activism, we can get really, really insular and really close and assume that everybody knows the things we're talking about, assume that everyone's a maker, assume that the world hasn't changed since the 80s and 90s, and people aren't a little bit more responsive to corporate uh, encroachment than they are. So I think that one of the things I would like to hear people talk a little bit more about is how do you broaden the conversations outside of what you're most comfortable with and what kind of outreach and proactive things do you do to try to figure out how do we invite more people in? Yeah, and I, I think that's, I mean, that's awesome uh, comments and questions. And I think it's not just that this is a closed group of people and the open web movement is a very kind of unidimensional group of people. And we need to look at how we broaden that. And I think some of the stuff that has started to emerge a little bit on the edges of, of Ford Foundation in linking the civil rights movement and the open internet movement is some hint at, at what's possible. I think the other piece is if this conversation, at least in this version of it, is tremendously North American, 
in a place where the internet is not North American and the internet that will matter is not North American. And so I, I think we do need to solve those challenges as well. And a, a thing I struggle with in Mozilla is it also is an asset so to a question of what do we do about it. Um, very, very Silicon Valley based leadership and very Silicon Valley based blinders on, I think is something that we really struggle with, but a global community that is predominantly not North American and how we actually create space for leadership of that community to be driving the direction of Mozilla is the thing that I really try to push sometimes successfully more often than not uh, unsuccessfully. But I, I do think that to be to the point of looking at where is the next generation of leaders look coming from, look way beyond the borders, whether it's this room or this country. Are y'all seeing any examples, um, practical examples of where it's working, where, where there is collaboration, where the global community is getting better educated, especially in places like China and Pakistan, um, Turkey? Where are the are are they growing leaders there in in an effective way? So I mean I, I think a very small way just on stuff we're working on is we're trying to really grow the digital literacy part of what we're doing as a grassroots effort, and that's a place where we're seeing way more take up in South Asia than we are in say well maybe not no, more than North America but like in in equal measure and in ways that are very different and adaptive and so that's one place I think we see it inside of ourselves. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one example. We focus on the U.S., so I, uh... Okay, sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one, another question from... Uh, hi, I'm Cool Wadawa. Um, from Stanford, but I also, um, ran Wikipedia for a long time on the mobile side, so I basically spent all my time somewhere else. So I take the more global perspective, but, um, I'm a little pessimistic. Um, obviously, you know, Firefox OS is kind of the big push, right? Because for most people, it's mobile or nothing. And you guys have only sold one million devices so far, so it's hard to build an ecosystem. So I'm kind of thinking, should there be a more radical approach to you know, the open internet? Because we don't know if you're gonna be successful. You obviously would like that to happen. But you talk about digital, digital literacy with kids. I mean, I'm focused on kids as well, but should we kind of start picking like where our battles are, like concentrate resources? Because like, what if you don't win? You know, you're not viable in a mobile operating space. What are the other options? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess I, I didn't understand quite the last part in terms of concentrating resources because my, my argument would be that we need to actually make like dozens, thousands, tens of thousands of different bets. Like, at, at, I actually think the, the likelihood that Firefox OS as an operating system succeeds is way less than 50%. I mean, and, and so I, I think, you know, you do want to look at ways that everything from encouraging people to look at digital literacy on a, on a massive scale to trying to disrupt the other mobile operating systems of which I think there are ways that we may engage in, in that piece of it. But I think part of it is the, you know, looking at how we back and encourage people who have ideas that we haven't thought of yet. I think that's what really, you know, nobody knew that Mozilla or Wikipedia or any of the other things that we think of ha as having been successful disruptions, nobody saw those coming in 1994 when we first got Mosaic, or 1993 when we first got Mosaic. So like, I actually don't know all the places to look, and it's likely that the places that will have the impact and will shape it uh, are you know, not places we know. And that's why I think the, the previous comment is so critical, is in the next two, three years, in the next five years, in the next 25 years, like we are gonna keep hitting those walls, and unless the ethos we're talking about is infused in people in an incredibly diverse set of, you know, contexts. You know, we're, we're get, maybe we'll win a little bit now, but we're going to keep getting screwed. So, like, I, I can give you my five strategies, but I don't think that that's actually what matters. I think what matters is how we solve the problem of really opening up to a much broader world and a much more diverse leadership. And to that end, um, and this is for either of you, what, what are y'all, what is your foundation, what is your, uh, your, and what is your foundation and company doing um, to try and be more proactive in reaching out to people of color, women, who, whose voices and perspectives you will need uh, to shape the next five, ten hundred years? Five, ten hundred? Of the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, I, I think the biggest thing that Mozilla does uh, is the community piece of it, which is really focused globally on a, a tremendous amount of diversity. And so that, that part has 
been in ebbs and flows, a part of who we are, and I, I feel at least a part of what we're doing is in the, in the up cycle. And so how you actually give those people, like historically, Mozilla has had a governance system which is separate from the company and the foundation, where volunteers have a fair bit of decision-making power. We really worked in the last couple of years to build, renew a kind of set of community leaders and decision makers who are from all parts of the world. And so building that up is, I think, probably the most promising effort. There are other things that I think are more traditional about building diversity inside the company, inside the closer community in terms of education stuff that is targeting people who are underrepresented in our community or in our company. But I, and I think that stuff's important. But in the long run, I think that community leadership piece is the, what's gonna pay off. Yeah, and I would say in the place, so one of our products is, is called Madison. It's an online crowdsourcing uh, tool for legislation, policy, regulation. Uh, and it's working mostly in, in local governments. DC, we got a, our DC friend, f folks back there. Uh, that's one of the places that we're working. And when we feature, we, so we feature different policy uh, items that are going through um, and we kind of have to pick. So when we look at what, what we're featuring, what we're trying to get out to people, we're treating everybody, all different colors, all different creeds, all different backgrounds and genders as user groups. And so when we want to get more users involved in that process, we'll feature policies that are of interest to them. And that's just a start. I mean, we're literally just at the, at the early days of figuring out how to make this work. Um, but we are seeing that, that response. And it's not, um, it's not male, female, black, white, but it's this policy is of interest. I want to get online and I want to say something about it. I want to collaborate on it. And we're seeing almost a, a perfect mirror of the cities in which we're working based on those policy areas. So I think that if you present your, your open internet principles to everybody where they start and where they stand and on issues that they care about, um, you're almost backdooring in uh, the things that we're trying to get across and involve those new communities. We have time for about one more question. Up front. Run, John. Hi, I'm Ling Xiaoli. I'm from ASU, and I work as a part-time web developer. As I was doing my job, I found out I have to specify a, a line of code for every different browsers because of the like different JavaScript impl uh, implementation, or they only accept certain type of audio format or something like that. Do you think in the near future that uh, the mainstream browsers will like work hands with hands and uh, make the web a more open environment? Um, I, mean, I think that we're always trying, or and I think one of the things that we really struggle well, struggle with is not even necessarily the right way to put it. I mean, one of the, the issues when we talk about standards is when you've got you know five browsers, four browsers out there, there's a, a tension between innovating, and then it means that you're not going to negotiate in advance how people implement those standards and truly becoming standardized where it is the same. I mean, like a, a bold tag across all the browsers is, is the same because we've had it forever. Audio formats, for example, are something new, and so there's still a, a lot of negotiation. So mostly it's about how that negotiation happens. I think the, the one risk, I mean, especially in mobile, is there have to be incentives for that alignment to happen. And, and where what you see is you see the different browsers going more slowly and getting to the world of, of kind of cross-platform, you're talking about where they can keep some advantage in keeping the standard fragmented. And I think you'll see that um, tension for a long time, especially in mobile, where um, you know Google may have um, some interest in implementing a bunch of their web API standards. At the same time, that erodes their Android kind of market share. And so you know, I think you're, you're gonna see arm wrestling for a long time. All right, and before we wrap, I, I want y'all, since we've, this, is, this conversation has kind of careened all over the place, one thing that we didn't get to touch on that we, I just want to hit really briefly is obviously there is a business imperative. It sounds great to be all open and have open source, but um, there's a reason why there's uh, proprietary software out there that um, moves fast and when it comes to development and makes a lot of money. They, they have that bottom line imperative. And so um, how do you think about sort of the business part of this? Um, in order, uh, because because frankly, you know, making money is important in order to, in order for a lot of these companies to succeed. 
making money is very important. Very, very important. Um, I think Waldo actually is one of one of my uh, sort of load stars on this issue is that if you make something that's good enough uh, and provides a service, somebody's going to pay for it. Um, that's not something that uh, at least I have been in the open source world very comfortable with to start with. Um, but we're coming up against vendors, people who are working in codification for city laws, for example, uh, who that's their, their job. They have mouths to feed. They've got employees. Um, how do we, so we're partnering with them. Instead of going to war, we're partnering with them to help them get better, help them get more open, and continue to innovate their industry and their companies to survive into a world of an open web um, and we're getting the data so we're actually helping them turn their data to be more open and they're starting to use our open source software and then they're using both to turn around and sell a service to a city so hopefully it's benefiting their bottom yeah, yeah. I, I mean certainly it even says in the mozilla manifesto which stands for all of this openness that that is in the context of of commerce that we have both uh, an interest in a public and a, a commercial part of the internet existing. And so certainly, you know, we believe in that. But I think at the very base, there also are core pieces that we need as a, as a common, predictable level playing field that is a public resource for, for all of us. I mean, if we think, I, I had a very bizarre experience. If anybody is interested in U.S. nonprofit ta tax law, I'll, you know, buy me a beer and I'll tell you about it. But where I had to fight with the IRS over whether protecting the internet was a charitable act. Uh, and you know, quietly in the background over three years and about half a million dollars in legal fees, we won. And the, the reason is, or the, the, the thing we won on, is if you go back to 16th century English law, where they established you know, what is a public good, maintaining the roads was a public good. If I put my money into keeping the roads open because commerce, because people go into church, because people go in to visit their families, whatever you're doing can travel over them, that is providing a public good. And ultimately, the internet has become so central to our lives that we need that public good layer. We need the networks to be open, we need the standards and the programming languages that anyone can use in common. And yes, of course you wanna be able to make money and make art and meet girls or do whatever you want on top of that. But the internet ultimately has become and must remain a public good. Sorry. Yes. I was, fair point. <laughs> All right. Um, w w with that, um, our time is up. Thank you guys for participating in this discussion. Um, really substantive stuff. Thank you guys for uh, all your thoughts. Mark Sermon and Seamus Kraft. Thank you.